want to say two things, basically. I hope I will disturb some people, and I hope that I will make some people happy. Um, I'm going to speak about romance and the romanticization of the notion of culture and how it sits uh, in the distance between working people and the majority of us who are located outside of the state and the structures and systems of ruling on our continent. That's one point that I'd like to speak to. And the second point, which really uh, uh, travels with the, this whole issue of romance, um, is the issue of exclusion. And civil society, which is the topic that I'm requested to speak to, um, has been the bridge, the positioning, the space, discursive, organizational, alternative, between the majority of Africans who are working people everywhere on this continent and actually everywhere where we live uh, in the world. Uh, it's a very interesting sort of identity that we've carried for several uh, hundred years, especially those of us who left the continent, and those who occupy the state. I'm um, going to try and see if I can... Right. So I think that uh, these three days, while we are uh, discussing who the new Africans are, who do we want to become, I think we have to find the ways of thinking about ourselves that enable us to clarify the past, the colonial and the pre-colonial past, um, and also to imagine post-colonial societies. And in my presentation, I'm going to make a distinction between neocolonialism and post-coloniality, because I think it's an important distinction to make. The neocolonial state is a continuation of the colonial infrastructure, ideological, hierarchical, in terms of privilege, and even the very notions of culture. But a post-colonial state, not just chronologically, but ideologically and epistemologically, in terms of thinking past this present situation that we are faced with on the continent, a post-colonial state is a different state of being for Africans. And I hope that I can just maybe pr provoke one or two discussion points. The issue of romance, um, I think, is deeply, deeply problematical. And as the speaker before me, uh, 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 the, uh, the Professor Adesami uh, spoke about culture and the, the, how crucial culture is. But we have to undress culture of the romance that our societies were egalitarian and were kind and caring prior to colonialism because they were not. Across this continent, the real history of Africa tells us that we were either living in feudal states, in slaving states, or in small groups, small communities, that uh, explored and practiced for various forms of communalism. And I know that my colleague, uh, Professor Kumete, is very um, engaged with the notion of communalism. And I think it's really important for us when we look back to ask a different set of questions so that we can look forward in new ways. And communalism, uh, when it is romanticized, uh, can become extremely dangerous. And the experiences of India uh, teach us some very difficult lessons about communalism. An unscrutinized, uninterrogated notion of communalism, that doesn't go anywhere, actually, because conceptually it has 
it doesn't have drivers, if I could use the new technological language. It's embedded in a notion of the past that once again is shrouded in romance. There are very good reasons why we hold on to notions of romance as Africans, because we've been brutalized so terribly. No other group of people on the earth has been brutalized and has been disparaged and deprecated in the ways that Africans have survived those really foul and heinous experiences. But we don't need romance in that way because it keeps us in the past in ways that block us. I want to make reference to a very important issue that has become a popular rallying point right now. And this is the issue of the abduction of, um, nobody actually says the actual number of girls, but you know it's in the region of, and I, that really disturbs me, because humans are not in the region of. Every single human counts. So we should be speaking about a specific number of human beings who uh, are invisible, basically, in our societies, except when they are mauled, except when they are, uh, you know, attacked, and often under the guise of cultural practices. Now, I would like somebody to tell me why. Is it the numbers? Because when I heard about the abduction, I said, yeah, but women are abducted everywhere on this continent every day. Girls are abducted all the time into forced marriages and planned marriages and child marriages. You just go to Malawi that is voting for democracy right now. The levels of abduction of girls are horrendous, horrendous. So why is it that this particular instance of abduction is particularly disturbing? Is it the numbers? And the numbers are not even exact. So let's ask ourselves, what is it that gets hidden in these notions of culture that are clothed in romance and that enable certain practices to continue systematically as though they are unproblematical. And it's only when they become large enough and visible enough that we are outraged. But we still can't solve the problem. I mean, people are pointing at the state rulers in Nigeria, oh, they are inept, they are incompetent, etc. But that incompetence actually is generalized when it comes to the bodily, sexual, emotional, spiritual integrity of girls everywhere on this continent. And by the way, in all the other continents as well. Because the trafficking of young females in Europe, in North America, in Asia, you know, this is the new gold. So let's ask ourselves, why are we drawn so easily to the populism of doing SMSs and all the stuff that's going on with the new technology? And not asking the deeper questions about how exclusion 